I'd like to invite, after this photo op, Nitsana Darshan Leitner to introduce our next speaker. So this is one of the highlights of the conference, would call it the grande finale. I would like to call to the stage a man that served in the elite unit of the IDF, Sayeret Matkal, as a commander. I would like to call the man that has been leading the fight to defend IDF soldiers in the cabinet a man that needs no further introduction, Minister of Education and Diaspora Affairs, Mr. Bennett Naftali. Nitsana, you talked about fighters. I think you're the fighter. My friends, I, I know that throughout the day um, the dignitaries were mentioned again and again, so I'll just call you my friends because I think everyone here has a common goal. I think Shurat uh, Adin has shown what a determined uh, small group can do with a very uh, laser-focused goal and powerful leadership. And I think there's a lot we in Israel, in the state of Israel, in the government, can learn from you. I just want to talk about three things, three insights regarding the battle against uh, delegitimization, against BDS, against lawfare, against the idea of closing on Israel from a different angle because nothing else is working against us, right? Conventional wars have not been successful. Israel has persevered through endless waves of terror. The last one was uh, during the past year. And this time what was very unique about it is that the Israeli public beat the terrorists. In the past it was the Israeli armed forces. This time, quite literally, it was the people of Israel who are in the process of defeating the terrorists. Because the single biggest demotivator of terror is lack of success. And when they go out to kill Israelis and there's always an Israeli citizen or policeman or soldier out there determined to confront terror and put an end, and ultimately when the terrorists um, finish their lives at that point and have only medium or less than, than that success, that's a demotiva demotivator and vice versa. Success breeds success. So I think the Israeli public has been the real hero of the past year. So given that conventional wars and terror are not working. So about a decade ago, the BDS movement came to be. At the beginning of the decade, Israel's GDP was $153 billion in 2006. A decade later, a decade of BDS later, we're up to just about $3 billion. We doubled our... So in some sense, BDS lacks the D. <laughs> However, it's not only BDS, it's not only the economy, because on the economy we have to just look at the fact that I said we've doubled our G GDP, Israel's high tech has never been better, but there is massive uh, work on delegitimizing Israel 
and I'm sure you're all aware of it. So I just want to talk about three aspects. The first one, we have to change the battlefield. The single most important law of strategy in, in warfare, conventional warfare, is if you're in a battlefield that has the conditions that are stacked against you, don't fight there. Move to a different location. When I ran a business uh, and I was in cutthroat competition for a couple of years, the biggest move I did was move to a different market. Stop fighting them. Play your strengths. And in Israel's case, the unfavorable battlefield is to continue to obsess day in, day out with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And it seems that there's many Israeli politicians who obsess with it. You ask them, you know, how's the economy? Well, we need a two-state solution. <laughs> What's going on with education? Nothing's going to work until we have a Palestinian state. And you might think that walking across the streets of Israel, it's all about a Palestinian state, yes or no. Well, you know, when I wake ev up every day, I, I'm busy, busy with making four sandwiches for my kids and sending them to school. There's a few other things in life. So what we need to do is stop obsessing about the unsolvable piece, because it is unsolvable, it's manageable, but not solvable, and move to our strengths. And our strength is the light upon nation strategy. Israel today is positioned to solve global problems, some of the most central global problems, and the world needs us. So let's cater to those needs instead of obsessing about the one aspect that is not right now solvable. What do I mean? Technology, we're there. The fact that Israel startup is a startup nation is a fact and, and we're exporting medical stents, GPS systems, dairy production, agriculture, food. That's happening. We can and should do much more, but that's happening. But there's much more. We need to export the art of innovation because we're good at it. For example, I'll give you a positive example. This September, I invited an OECD summit. The first time there's going to be an OECD education minister summit about how to teach innovation. How, what, what's the ingredient in Israel that generates all these innovators? What are we doing right? How can we teach it? And you know what? They're all coming. Everyone I invited is coming because they have a, a pressing need, right? When you're a salesperson, you think about the customer's needs, not about your problems and what the world needs now. The economy is stagnating. They need innovation almost as a survival tool. And we have the answers right over here. So let's do it. In Israel, we have informal education where kids are instructors of kids in, in the scouts. In America, it's adults who instruct the kids. And that builds character at a young age. We can teach this. The Jewish history has a unique pedagogic methodology that's been used successfully for just about 2,000 years. It's called Chevruta. Let's export it. It works. I mean, it's worked. So why aren't we exporting all this amazing, all these assets? On security, say no more. We're the most threatened nation on earth. In the north, we've got Hezbollah. In the northeast, we've got Jabhat al-Nusra. In the south, we've got Daesh. In the southwest, we've got Hamas. But we're all having a ball here. <laughs> so something's working. We've cracked the formula to deal with terror, but thrive. And we're not ruining our quality of life or our human rights. People live here in dignity, while at the same time, we're somehow doing something right. And I know there's a national sport to hit ourselves and blame ourselves, but man, we're doing a fairly good job. The whole world needs to learn this. 
So that's item number one. Play our strengths and move away from the lesser territory. I didn't mean that literally. <laughs> the second aspect. We have to talk about our rights. Stop talking pragmatism only. No, it's not about security. It's about, this is our home. And I can, sp <sighs> we followed a faulty strategy for the past several decades and unfortunately a few years ago with the, the Bar Ilan speech. And I have to explain. Some people feel the Bar Ilan speech was very smart because it bought us time, etc. No. When you effectively say, this land belongs to a different people, but we have security needs, that claim will hold for a month, a year, but it erodes. Ultimately, people say, well, if it's their land, why are you building there? That's inconsistent. Ultimately, in the short term, security works. In the long term, it doesn't. And let's be honest with ourselves. Are we in Israel just because of security? Is Israel really the most secure place on earth? What about Perth, Australia? <laughs> Teaneck, New Jersey, right? Hey, calm down with Teaneck there. So is it really all about security? No, it's something more simple. It's our home and it's that simple. And time and again, how can we expect the world to justify and fight for us if we don't make the, the basic claim? So I know it's tough, but I do it day in, day out with ministers from all around the world. We have an amazing meeting about education, innovation, chevruta, startup, what you do there, the army, this, that. Usually it doesn't come up, but sometimes, rarely, they'll, they'll say, what about the Palestinian state? And then I look them in the eye and say, listen, this has been our home for 3,800 years. How long do you live in your country? <laughs> now, we're cognizant of the fact that there are 1.8 or 2 million Arabs in Judea and Samaria. They need a solution. They need... I believe in an autonomy and we should talk. There is a lot about to talk. We, we don't want to govern them. So we're not in La La Land. We're in the real world, but it starts from, it's our home, now let's talk. And I believe that if we're persistent and clear about that, ultimately the world will respect us because the world, The world respects a nation that respects itself. The third and final aspect is get on the field and start fighting. Because you can't win if you don't fight. Now everyone, I'm sure I've, I've not heard the other lectures, but everyone realizes that this is one of the delegitimization battle, the, the lawfare battle, the diplomatic battle is, is, a, is a dangerous one. It's a central one to our future. Yet the energy that we spend as a nation on security, on the army, on the air force is, is infinite while we barely deal with this. But this, effectively ties our hands and erodes our physical force, sometimes 70% downward. Just imagine that, that out of 10 rifles, only three shoot because of this. So doesn't it follow that you need to do something about it and spend perhaps half of your energy, half of your budget on the 
battle of legitimization. So what I suggest, everyone knows this, I think it's time to get on the field and act. I mean, why is the startup nation acting like a dinosaur when it comes to delegitimization? What we need to do, we have several agencies in Israel. We have the Mossad, we have the Shabak, we have the military. We need an agency dedicated to lawfare, delegitimization, BDS, and the diplomatic war. They wake up in the morning, they deal with it, they have a massive budget, no less than a couple of F-35s. Because if we don't have that agency, those F-35s will stay on the ground. Those are the three takeaways, and I'm gonna leave it at that. Fight the right battlefield, meaning play our strengths as a startup nation, as a startup nation and light upon nation, so I would call it the light upon nation strategy. Two, talk rights and not only security. And three, get out there, fight and win, and we will win. Toda raba. Thank you so much, Minister Bennett. We have a couple more things before we wrap up today, if we can ask for your patience a few more minutes. Alona, are we ready with the video? Okay. So this isn't part of the program, and it'll only take a few minutes, but we have gotten so many questions from so many people, and when I say we, I mean myself and the rest of the Shurat Adin staff, about what we do, how we do it, and how we're funded. So we thought we would take a few minutes to explain that, because if 50 of you asked, you asked then I'm guessing hundreds are wondering. So first we'll show you a short film. Naftali was 16 years old. He was on his way back from school when we found out he was kidnapped with uh, Gilad and Eyal. Eventually, after 18 intensive, anxious days of search that involved the whole Jewish world, we found them murdered. For Jews around the world, this month revolves around Yom HaZikaron and Yom HaTzma'ut. During this time period, we commemorate the tragedies that have befallen our people and the great sacrifices that have been made in Israel, both by our soldiers and by victims of terror. Avram David was 16 and in 10th grade when he and seven other boys and young men were gunned down. It's been eight years now, but the grief never goes away. There's always an empty space where he should be. My name is Shana Gould, and at 19 years old, I was in a terrorist attack on Jaffa Road in Jerusalem. I arrived dead on arrival at Charit Tzedek Medical Center. Today, I have three beautiful boys and a wonderful family. I'm still in pain, though, every single day, including right now. On October 13th, 2015, my father, Richard Lakin, boarded uh, bus number 78 in Jerusalem. He was on his way home from a regular doctor's appointment. Two terrorists boarded the bus and started shooting. They shot him in the head, and then stabbed him in the face and the chest and slit his stomach uh, wide open. He was rushed to Hadassah Hospital, where he was in intensive care unconscious for two weeks uh, before he passed away. Shurat Adin is an aggressive reaction to terror that says there is a price for spilling the blood of the innocent. We fight terrorism in court. We represent hundreds of terror victims in the past 13 years who've been suing the terror organizations and their financial patrons, and we've been winning in court. Shirat Dean has really helped me feel less like a victim. My son, Avram Davi, no longer has a voice, but Shirat Dean helps give me a voice. 
Facebook's been facilitating incitement to terror all around the world for years now. And Shuat Adin helped us speak up. They were the first to, to take on Facebook head to head. And I think uh, began uh, a worldwide recognition uh, of the importance of dealing with the issue of incitement on social media. To me, Shuat Adin is a part of fighting terror in every possible arena. Shuat Adin is giving a voice to the terror victims, but we cannot do it without you. We have to make sure that the terror victims get justice. So this is what we do. These are the people we proudly represent, and they're the, the reason for everything that we do. And so, to answer the question that we've been asked by so many today and yesterday, and we're always asked, how can you help? Yes, we are 100% funded by private donors. Uh, we do need help. We would love for you to make Shurat Adin one of your charities. But you're also helping by being here. At Shuret Adin, we fight terrorism in court. We fight de delegitimization of Israel in court. We get justice for these people who are so broken and deserve some measure of compensation. And we teach others how to advocate for them and for Israel. And so I would like to applaud all of you for coming here, for learning with us, for taking this so seriously. And I know that you're gonna take this home and you're gonna use the information that you've learned and you're gonna join us in the trenches and you're gonna help us with this fight. So I applaud you for being here. You can also, for the lawyers in the room, and I know there are a number of you, we have a lawyer seminar. We have an intense one-week training seminar for lawyers to learn how we do the work that we do. Invite your friends from abroad. The more people we can get here, and to echo some of the sentiments from before, it does not need to be Jewish lawyers. The more people we can get here to teach what's really happening and how to combat it, the bigger our army is going to get all around the world. We have law student internship programs for anybody who knows law students. And yes, to answer the question of so many of you, we do accept volunteers. The vast majority of our volunteers are lawyers and law students, but if you have other skills that you think that would be helpful to us, some people mentioned translation, there are a number of things that we can use. You are welcome. There's an email address on the back of your folder. Send us an email, tell us about you, we will add you to our volunteer list, and we may contact you the next time there's something that comes up that uh, involves your skill set. But at the end of the day, Shred Adin is a nonprofit organization, it costs a lot of money to do the things that we do, and we so appreciate your coming here, and we appreciate your asking how you can help. So, thank you. Um, I want to now call up Nitsana Darshan Leitner. Oh, wait, sorry, Nitsana. One last thing. Practical, because this is a very practical group. Everybody asks me very practical questions. Um, many people ask me, how do you donate? The answer is, uh, also on your, on your folders is our website. There are, there's a link there to use to donate. There's also information about how you can send checks. We do have tax deductible status in many different countries. Uh, and we'll also send you an email after the close of the conference with a link in case uh, that's easier for anybody. And now I would like to call Nitsana Darshan Leitner to close this conference. Well, I would like to say first and foremost, thank you. Thank you for the great speakers that join us in these two terrific days that enlightened us, that brought to a discussion issues that I know we'll take from here, spread over, learn and teach others. Thank you 
for participating. 500 today, 500 yesterday. Great turnout. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank those who, without them, this conference would not happen. So I would like to thank our staff, Alona Tomer, who worked day and night, then and night, and even had nightmares <laughs> about this conference. Alona, thank you very much. I would like to thank Margalit from Isram, who facilitated all this hotel accommodation, rooms, food, everything. You should, we should admit the accommodation was five stars. I would like to thank Avi Gaze and Robert Feldmeyer for the educational program. Great speakers, great work. I would like to thank our IMC, Rachel Weiser, who did a tremendous job. Talia Herring, who helped. And all the interns that happened to come here at the same time we were organizing this conference, who did a tremendous job. Thank you very much from all over the world. And I would just like to summarize and to say that we touched upon different threats, different challenges that Israel is facing. Started with the social media, with the incitement, begins, um, continues with ISIS, Hamas, Hezbollah, war crimes allegations against us, hostile ICC, many threats that we have to face, we have to challenge. And the government needs our help. The government cannot do what we do. The government cannot represent itself in the ICC. The government cannot file lawsuits against Facebook or Twitter. The government cannot sue banks or other states. The government is restrained. They need NGOs like Shurat Adin to take this war and we are proud to do it. We are doing, we're fighting on behalf of the state of Israel. We're fighting on behalf of the Jewish community worldwide. We're fighting against terrorism because we can win the cases. We're doing it because we are winning the cases. And we are doing it because we don't have any other choice. We live in Israel, and we want to send our kids to school and make sure they're coming back safe. We want to ride our buses. We want to sit in our cafes. We want to live safely in our country. And yes, this is our country. We will continue the fight. We would like you all to join us in this battle. And I promise you that in the end, we will win. In the end, Israel will win. Thank you so much.